afternoon. Good evening. Hello. Okay, it's working. Fantastic. Good evening, everybody. My name is Susan Goldberg, and I'm the new president and CEO of GBH. We are delighted to have you here in our Boston Public Library studios, where we are broadcasting several times a week. And it is so delightful to have you here for this really important event. Although I have just moved here from Washington, D.C., I know that Boston is a city full of smart and engaged people. And so it's so good to have many of you with us here tonight. And in fact, we are here because Ed DeMore and Sandra Lopez Burke, who leads our community engagement, bumped into each other in this very space. And it was their conversation that led to tonight's event. You know, I wanted to also thank the people who have been great G GBH supporters here over, over the years, people like Rick Burns and Chris and Lisa Canab and many more. So it really fills me with pride to be able to be part of this organization that brings so many important discussions into a public forum. And that is in fact why we are all gathered here tonight. And I'm so proud to be able to be with Rainey Aronson Rath, our executive producer of Frontline and the editor in chief of that show, and, and our guest to discuss one of the most important events of our time, really looking at the changing world order. And so, Rainey, let me turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan. It's wonderful to be with you. Boss, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome to everyone. It's wonderful to be together. I'm Rainey Aronson Roth, as Susan said, and I'm the executive producer and editor in chief of Frontline. And I'm thrilled to be with you all here tonight at the Boston Public Library. And for those of you online, welcome. Frontline has been lucky enough to call GBH our home for the past 40 years. Yes, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this month. Together with GBH, Frontline has been able to produce nearly 800 documentaries about current events, spanning dozens of countries through waves of political, economic, and technological changes. And the past year has been no different. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February of last year, Frontline has closely covered the conflict. We partnered with the Associated Press to produce on-the-ground investigations into possible war crimes and examine life in Russia under Vladimir Putin's crackdown on dissent. Later this month, we'll premiere our film 20 Days in Mariupol, an unflinching account of life under Russia assault at the Sundance Film Festival. Tonight, we'll be talking about some of the ways that conflict has rippled across the globe. We'll learn more about the consequences of the war in Ukraine on the global economy, the response of the war from China and the U.S., and what all of this means for the future of Russia, China, and U.S. relations. To help us understand these changing dynamics, I'm joined by two distinguished experts in Chinese and Russian affairs. Dr. Alexandra Vercru is the executive director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. Her scholarly work covers Russia and Eurasian policy issues. Dr. Tony Seish is the director of Rajawali Foundation Institute for Asia and Daiwu Professor of International Affairs at Harvard. He teaches courses in government, politics, and economy with a focus on China. He is the author of a fascinating book I really hope you'll all read, From Rebel to Ruler, 100 Years of the Chinese Communist Party from Harvard University Press. Thank you both for joining us tonight and for this fascinating conversation. So let's start in the news. You know, I'm a current affairs person. So just last week, we know that Xi and Putin met over video conference. I got to jump in right there. What did you make of that? Well, I think it's just a, a reassurance that uh, despite all that's happened in terms of the conflict in Ukraine, the pressure from the U.S., that this is still a fundamental uh, basis uh, for their relationship to build what they think of as being a new global order. Mm -hmm. I thought was what was perhaps most interesting about the discussions, apart from the lavish praise they uh, heaped on one another, was that if you looked at the Russian reporting of the meeting, it uh, featured quite prominently the fact that uh, Putin had invited Xi to come and visit in Moscow. When I looked at the Chinese initial reporting, it did not mention that at all. Hmm. So I think uh, that, I think, was uh, China's way to kind of wiggle around and uh, say, yeah, we're great friends, but you know, mm -hmm. we might not want to get too close uh, given the current global situation. 
And what did you see when you saw that? Well, I think that really reflects the fact that this relationship right now is much more important for Putin than it is for Xi. Mm -hmm. He's certainly preoccupied with some domestic problems, but for Putin, Xi is the lifeline, given how much has been cut off from mm -hmm. Europe since the war began. Well, let's talk about the beginning. So if you rewind a year ago, February 2022, so you have this conversation between two of them in person at the time where they say and they proclaim a friendship without limits. So I would love an interpretation from both of you about what does it mean when she and Putin say friendship without limits a year ago? Well, I mean, I think to follow on from, from the last point, I, I would say there's two different aspects uh, to that relationship. The first, if you like, is more at a kind of geopolitical, geostrategic level. And that follows on from the point we made earlier that clearly both sides see this as a partnership, if not an alliance, that is attempting to build a different global order, one that can challenge the preeminence of the United mm. States of America in global affairs. But I think buried underneath that, there's a very practical element to it. Alexandra just said about the practical uh, needs uh, from Russia, but there's also practical needs from China's side. Ultimately, uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership have come to the conclusion that the long-term problem for them is the United States of America. Mm. And that's where there's going to be confrontation over a longer period of time. Well, under those circumstances, what better situation could you have than a huge partner on your border that can offer you energy, can offer you oil, it can offer you mm. liquefied natural gas, it has uh, minerals, it has other kinds of resources uh, that would be very difficult for the United States or the West to interfere with the supply. So it has a strategic and a practical dimension to uh, the closeness of that relationship and when they talked about it being without limits. And as was mentioned, it's clear that uh, Russia now is the younger uh, relation. Mm. Yeah, and, and when you look at it from the Russian perspective, if you look at it just a year ago, and then of course I want to talk about today, what were they hoping for? And that friendship without limits, what does that mean to Russians? And, and also if you would talk about Russians themselves and what it means to them. Okay, that's a lot of questions. I know, all together. so go with two. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the first thing is that I think when they had that meeting before the war started, the friendship and the cooperation was going to be something very different than what it has become mm. since the war started. At that time, it's important to note that it was a friendship. It was not directly an alliance, so they weren't committing to mm -hmm. engage militarily if the other mm -hmm. one were attacked, for example. But the idea was that they were able to provide each other with something that they needed. So in the case of China, this was hydrocarbons from Russia or perhaps some advanced military technologies. Of course, China is an important market for Russia. And what I had noticed when I was in Moscow is that more and more people were learning Chinese rather than mm. English in order to be able to turn to greater economic opportunities uh, in Asia. Since the war started, Putin has been significantly weakened. Mm. And so now he needs China more than China needs the US. And I'm sure Tony can talk to the fact that the, the Russians were very disappointed when she appeared to make an opening mm. to Europe and to the United States that was much warmer than what the Russians had anticipated. I think since the war started, the Russians have been disappointed that China has been hedging its bets and they are forced to be quite responsive to what she thinks they should be doing in Ukraine. I mean, that's really interesting. I have to just ask you one more question. So people are learning Chinese. How, how does that manifest itself uh, in Russia? Is it in the schools? Is it independent? How did you see that? When, when we were going to the top universities and we were having different meetings and conferences, you'd be walking down the hall and instead of hearing like people in English classes or Spanish classes or German classes, you would hear Chinese in almost every classroom. That's really interesting. <laughs> so Tony, if you looked at uh, the original response, she's original response, so just staying back and when Ukraine uh, had just been invaded by Russia. What did she originally do and what significance did you see there? Um, I think, uh, you know, something must have been said when they had the conversation. Now, of course, the Chinese have tried to obscure that by saying that, uh, well, we didn't really know, we weren't really sure. But I think the important thing is that you know, China has consistently followed Russia's uh, key talking points. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the blame has fallen squarely on NATO expansion mm -hmm. and the U.S. activities rather than it being anything to do with Putin himself. 
So at that level of the rhetoric, mm -hmm. they've been pretty uh, consistently supportive and in favor of Putin. I think uh, she has been frustrated. They talked about, you know, in September that she had been critical mm -hmm. of um, the situation in the war. I don't think that was because uh, of the war itself. I think it was like, why haven't you finished this off <sighs> more quickly? Yeah. Why haven't you got this done? You're just recreating a mess for all of us. But, you know, again, you need to parse out rhetoric from action. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what China's been doing, going back to the point that you just made about much warmer uh, opening or attempt to open to Europe and America, they've been careful not to alienate too much mm -hmm. uh, the West. So they've been careful not to get involved in activities that would bring uh, US and Western sanctions on them. Mm -hmm. They've been very careful about areas to do with uh, military cooperation, as mm -hmm. we've heard. And of course, um, the one area where they did intervene was to say pretty clearly and pretty loudly, no, the use of nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. threatens of what nuclear weapons is clearly not acceptable. So they've tried to sort of walk that difficult line while not giving up the idea that the rock uh, foundation, if you like, is a much closer relationship with Russia. Mm, that's really interesting, especially the, the part about nuclear weapons. Would you talk about that as well and what kind of ripple effect that had um, as far as you know there? So one of the things that we strongly suspect is that China is being um, more compliant with what Russia is interested in, at least mm -hmm. publicly, but it's probably costing them something in negotiation. Mm -hmm. right? The Chinese are extremely good negotiators when mm -hmm. it comes to getting good prices for oil mm -hmm. and gas from Russia, mm -hmm. and I suspect that in exchange for not coming mm -hmm. out and criticizing Putin directly, they're getting additional concessions on the oil and gas they're buying that Russia is no longer able to sell to Europe. So there's, there's definitely... Um, benefit to China from having Russia on the back foot. And benefit to China, also benefit to Russia. Obviously, Russia is the, the junior partner at the moment. Can you talk just historically about their relationship, just for a moment, to detour from the current affairs edge here? What was that relationship like? Like, just even take us five or six years ago. The Russians have always been uh, ambivalent about China, I would mm -hmm. say. They're, um, they're seen by many Chinese, and Tony can speak to this more as racist, mm -hmm. um, and not particularly, um, mm -hmm. not viewing the Chinese with e equality necessarily. And even though the Chinese uh, pretend that Russia is an equal partner or an equal brother, it's pretty clear from the Chinese that they don't think that that's the case. So I, I think there's a pretty, um, clear understanding on both sides mm -hmm. that this is to some degree a marriage of convenience, right? It's good mm -hmm. for both of them now, but they don't really trust each other. They have mm -hmm. fought wars against each other. Mm -hmm. And the Russians are, of course, always slightly worried that they've got all that empty territory on the border with China, mm -hmm. and China has all of those people that need to be fed and who might need more land. And so I would be surprised, you no, know, 100 years from now, I don't think that they're going to be having partnerships without limits. <laughs> mm. What would you say? I think it raises an interesting question about, you know, for both countries, what is the most important relationship? And rhetorically, of course, it's the relationship between Beijing and Moscow. But I think ultimately for both of them, uh, over the longer term, it's how they can deal with the United States of America mm -hmm. becomes, I think, far more important. And I think going back to the point you made earlier about how, you know, perhaps Russia sees a certain superiority, I think you have to go back even further in history for that, and that's that, uh, you know, originally, of course, the Soviet Union saw it as the center for socialist movements around the world, mm -hmm. and of course, China, in that case, was certainly the junior partner, mm -hmm. but then, of course, it rebelled against that uh, mm -hmm. in the late 50s, going into the early 60s, very critical of what was happening mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union. They fought a border war mm -hmm. by the end of the 60s, and clearly, that pushed China to try and form close relationships with the United States of America uh, against what they saw as a greater threat from mm. the Soviet Union. So I only say that just to underline the fact that uh, this has been a, a relationship which has varied over time, and I don't think we should see it, uh, as you just said, as being stable 
way off into the future. Right. I mean, one thing that I've been thinking as I've read so much over the last year is how static the relationship seems in the American media. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm asking you for this perspective, because just knowing what we know, how many times this relationship has changed, amalgamated, just shifted within um, the geopolitical situation that they're facing, frankly. So to the United States, I, I take your point. What are they, what's their posture? What is going to be happening now? Could you talk about Russia right now in terms of their relationship vis-a-vis -vis China, but also that collective relationship to the US? So I would first say one thing that um, until relations between the US and Russia deteriorated with the start of the war, we were spending a lot of time going to, the, to Russia and saying, you know, like before you cozy up to the Chinese, just keep in mind that like, <laughs> They have their own motives for doing that. And the Russians would kind of, you know, nod in a non-committal way. And then finally, one, one of the analysts in Russia took me aside and said, do you think we're stupid? Like, mm -hmm. of course we know that China is a threat to us, but right now right. we have no choice. Right. So I think they're, they're actually quite sanguine under the surface about the risks that being closer or being dependent on China faces. Mm. Um, when it comes to the US, you know, one of the things that's always fascinated me is that um, because of the history of both being superpowers, the Russians would really like us to worry about them as much as they worry about us. Mm -hmm. And they just can't believe that Americans don't think about Russia every day the way that Russians think about the United States and NATO every day. Um, and to some extent, this idea that Russia needs to assert itself as a great power, it needs to show it's a great power, project strength abroad, be taken seriously, mm -hmm. that what happened in Ukraine is to some extent an extension of that insecurity. Ah, oh, that's really interesting. What would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that uh, I've heard people in Beijing say who are in the sort of foreign policy community is how could we let this happen? Mm. You know, how could we've got to a situation in our international affairs where we are now in such a diametrically opposed position to the United States mm. of America. It really does not help us. So there's a lot of concern from people within country about mm -hmm. the state that the relationship has come to. And uh, unlike with the way Washington may be viewing <laughs> Russia, I mean, as you would know, quite clearly, uh, Washington is now obsessed with China. I mean, obsessed, it doesn't matter <laughs> who we have coming up to here in executive ed programs or whatever, it's China, China, China. Mm -hmm. You know, China's the problem. What do we do? How do we deal with it? And that itself, I think, is extremely exaggerated, mm -hmm. uh, the fear that runs through Washington at the mm -hmm. present time. That's not to say we don't have differences with them, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be critical of them in certain areas, but I don't think we should go to the other extreme of overestimating the potential uh, danger that can come mm -hmm. from China. It has enough of its own problems to deal with. And I think in Washington, I think the really interesting question at the moment is how far does Washington really want to push things mm -hmm. in the relationship? And there in October last year, we saw for the first time, I think, um, the White House beginning to really define the nature of its relationship to mm -hmm. China. It first of all put in place the restrictions on export of right. semiconductors, a number of other materials. And then of course the national security strategy came out where it made it very clear Russia's a short-term problem. The real problem mm -hmm. long-term is China. China, right. Now, what interests me on that is, is that uh, those measures they took in October uh, to try and push China to accommodate US demands on certain issues around unfair practices? Or is it the start of an end game, which is really to squash the Chinese economy? Because actually Washington has a lot more tricks in its mm. box. You know, it could start in bio areas, it could mm -hmm. start in other technology areas, all of which could really cripple the, the Chinese economy. And I think we don't really know the answer to that at the moment. I was curious, of course, and I'm sure everyone in our audience is as well, about Taiwan. And everyone's asking the question, what's happening with Taiwan? I know you've an interesting perspective. <laughs> I ask this knowingly. <laughs> Well, you know, I was in Taiwan uh, not so long ago when uh, Washington was convinced invasion was about to happen. Mm -hmm. Nobody on Taiwan shared that view. Mm -hmm. It was very much, look, you know, this is the flavor of the month in Washington. We've lived with this for 60, 70 years. We know this is a continual threat. 
We do not see this as any more imminent now than it was a month ago, six months ago, nine months ago. I'm not discounting the fact there's a danger and there's potential there, but really the possibilities that China would invade Taiwan within near to medium future, I think are almost zero. I mean, Xi Jinping may have made some terrible mistakes recently, but he's not a complete idiot. Mm. And he must know, and having looked at what's happened in Ukraine, mm -hmm. that a premature invasion of Taiwan would be crippling in terms of US sanctions, Western sanctions, uh, problems it would bring to the Chinese economy and quite possibly bring the end to Communist Party rule in China. So I think they're willing to wait and I think they have other mechanisms to squeeze, mm -hmm. uh, withdrawing international space even further, you know, trade issues um, and, and uh, economic embargoes where they can keep pressure up on Taiwan. And there was a rumor that went around you know, some months ago that 2027 was going to be mm -hmm. the date for invasion. Well, yeah, there was a 100th anniversary of the founding of the Red Army. Mm -hmm. And one academic that I could trace it to from the People's University <laughs> had said it might be a possibility. And this kind of got picked up. <laughs> oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen 2027. Nobody of any authority or seniority in China has ever said that. What do you think when you look at that geopolitical situation, China watching Russia in Ukraine, what is Russia seeing? I mean, how are they seeing, let's talk first about Putin and Russia and the, the government side. Well, first of all, I would say that I think that China has been surprised at how difficult Russia has found mm -hmm. uh, its objectives in Ukraine, much mm -hmm. more difficult. I, we suspect that Putin had assured Xi that this would be a, a couple mm -hmm. days, they would take mm -hmm. Kiev and it would all be over. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it's much more complicated than that. Uh, they were also very surprised to see the extent to which the US and the West, uh, Western Europe united on sanctions mm -hmm. um, and managed to effectively isolate the 11th largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, it's still much chi smaller than China. China, but mm -hmm. freezing foreign reserves and cutting them off of the dollar are pretty serious steps, to say nothing of SWIFT. Um, and then the third thing is that they're thinking, like, this was pretty difficult, and this wasn't even an amphibious landing, yeah. mm. right? Like, what would it mean to have to get over the water right. and take Taiwan? So in that way, I agree with Tony that, if anything, the, the mess in Ukraine has made China perhaps more reluctant to take action on Taiwan than they might have been mm. beforehand. Um, in terms of the Russians, I really don't think they're worried very very much about Taiwan at the moment mm -hmm. um, or about China. They assume that China has their back um, when push comes to mm -hmm. shove. I mean, not that they're going to help militarily, but they're not going mm -hmm. to cut off the Russians so long as the Russians are providing at least oil and gas. So when you're looking at the people who are living in Russia, the Russians, the information, uh, Frontline's done a lot of reporting on this. What are they thinking right now about the invasion of Ukraine? Just I know you don't have a collective idea, but what are you right. starting to hear? So first of all, I would remind everyone that like when we talk about what are Russians thinking, it's like asking what are Americans, what are Americans thinking, think, right? right? So there, there's a huge divide on all questions um, according to where people are coming from and, and what their ideas are. Um, the second thing I would caution us is that we have no reliable public opinion polling now in mm -hmm. Russia anymore and no independent media. So we're trying to figure out what's mm -hmm. happening based on what we see happening on the streets to the extent that we can see it and what's happening on social media media channels, especially Telegram, Telegram which is right. what the Russians use. Um, and what we see there is that there is pressure on the Russian position. And interestingly, it's now coming from two sides, both the right and the left, for the first time. Hmm. So on the left, you have people who were opposed to the war, who think it was a terrible idea for a number of reasons. You also have those who are having family members suffering as a result of the mobilization and conscription. Either people killed or disappeared or wounded. Um, and they're starting to make noise about that. Oh. On the right, you have the, the uh, nationalist, far-right nationalists who are coming out and saying, actually, the Kremlin is not being aggressive enough in the way it's mm. fighting. They should be using nuclear weapons. They should be mm -hmm. you know, bombing all of the infrastructure mm -hmm. so there's no heat, heat or electricity. Why are we being so soft? And so the Kremlin is, finds itself kind of in the middle, which is a position it's never been in. Now, Putin doesn't really have to win re-election, but at the same time, as, as uh, Tim Fry, an analyst, says, you know, it's much easier to be a popular autocrat than an unpopular mm -hmm. autocrat. And Putin will want to find ways to keep people at least passive, mm -hmm. if not satisfied with what's going on. Now, I think yeah, I shared I think, with sorry, you, I just, yeah. I was just gonna say for, 
For China's perceptions, I, I think uh, another factor is involved that if you think about um, Russia, it's had military engagements in Crimea and elsewhere. China really hasn't had a military engagement since 78, 79 with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And war games are very different from actual realities mm -hmm. where everything goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, while there might be sort of concerns about the technologies that China has, they have never really fought an integrated war with modern technologies. And, you know, what we know happens is that anything that can go wrong does go wrong. Mm -hmm. And they have no experience of dealing with that, mm -hmm. unlike the US military mm -hmm. uh, over a very consistent period of time. Mm -hmm. So I think that must be causing them a lot of concern as well. That's a really astute point. I was going to ask you, um, I, I was going to share with you that, you know, on the frontline channels, we actually can see our YouTube channel has quite a number of Russians actually watching mm -hmm. our reporting on Russia. And you can see in the comments even people sharing their thoughts. And we have seen the same reflection you just shared on Telegram that you see far left and you see far right. And they're really arguing with each other um, in somewhat public um, forums, which has been surprising for us. And we've been reporting on that. So I guess my question is, how vocal can people be across that wide spectrum of belief right now in Russia? Well, it's hard to be vocal and not anonymous. Right On the far right, it's possible Absolutely. because right. that's a pro-government right. position. Um, and even those people that are arguing for greater aggression might be careful not to say the word war, which is taboo. Mm -hmm. You have to say special mm -hmm. military operation, or you could be actually sent to jail. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the left... So maybe Putin should have been sent to jail when he, he mentioned well, war. Well, that was a very interesting, <laughs> that was turning interesting. point yeah. Yeah, when he mentioned that. And, right. and, and you have a tension, right? If it's a special military operation, why do you have to keep mobilizing people, mm -hmm. right? So... They're, they're putting themselves in an, in an unpleasant corner, but in terms of the opposition, I mean, over the past 10 years, especially, well, since 2010, um, the Putin regime has managed to silence the independent media completely, uh, throw most of the leading opposition members in jail, and open its borders to anyone who disagrees enough to think that they just want to leave. And so it's very difficult now for people to organize or, or mobilize on the streets if they're against the regime. I mean, even, I think this happened in China as well, even holding a blank piece of paper can get you mm. arrested because the assumption is if you wrote anything, it would say no to war. Mm. So. The people who are protesting are incredibly brave, but there aren't very many of them. And when I look at what's been happening in Iran um, over the, the protests that started with headscarves and, um, and uh, the morality police, or in China over the COVID rules, I mean, those are similarly repressive mm -hmm. regimes, and people did take to the streets. We really don't see that happening in Russia right now, and it's not because everyone agrees with the war. I love it when a panelist actually brings up my next question, which <laughs> is, let's just take a moment and talk about the protests that we have been seeing over the last number of weeks in China. Yeah, um, one of the sayings in China is there's two hours of civil society and two hours of freedom. And that's the time between when people start posting messages mm -hmm. before the censors get on mm -hmm. and shut them down. Mm -hmm. So it is a very narrow window. I think the recent demonstrations, um, they're different in the sense that they had a spark, which of course was the death uh, from the fire in Northwest mm -hmm. China in Xinjiang. And, you know, it really triggered just frustration, which had been going on with months. And so it overflowed and it burst into the streets. Uh, it was extraordinary, there's no doubt about that. Um, it was in multiple cities. Mm -hmm. um, which again of itself was unusual. It wasn't coordinated, but people acting spontaneously. And then we saw basically the COVID restrictions lifting. Now, most of that has been reported over here as being the demonstrations led mm -hmm. to that lifting. I'm not, in Charlotte, I'm not actually sure that's true. Mm -hmm. I think it's part of the truth, but I think two other things were equally important. The first is that Omicron was entering mm -hmm. China and I think in that, as we know, spreads so much more rapidly mm -hmm. that I think they realized that the dams or the wall or whatever mm -hmm. you want to use were going to burst or break and that there was going to be a takeoff uh, of infections mm -hmm. in China no matter what. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I think was a big pressure from the business community mm -hmm. in China, mm -hmm. both international and domestic, that really 
these random lockdowns have been crap, uh, crippling mm -hmm. the economy. Mm -hmm. So I think those factors also weighed into the decision to uh, lift the lockdowns and constraints. What is totally puzzling is what an appalling mess mm. they made of things. Once they did uh, actually lift the constraints, they've had years to think about it. They've seen what has happened in other countries that lifted the uh, tight constraints, uh, not only Australia and Taiwan, but even in Hong Kong. So they must have known this was coming, and yet they really did not make sufficient preparations. Mm. Um, the over 60s, vulnerable, aren't sufficiently vaccinated. Mm. They haven't allowed in the most efficient uh, vaccines, in part because of vaccine nationalism, mm -hmm. and they have an extremely weak uh, health infrastructure in the countryside. So it really is absolutely baffling. And now, of course, they're just telling their people, yeah, well, you know, it's no worse than a cold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the number of deaths officially are very limited, but we know uh, from journalistic reporting and other things online that uh, uh, huge problems are being created in the hospitals, ICU units, crematoria. Mm. I contacted a bunch mm. of friends in uh, Beijing and only one of them has not had COVID. Mm. I talked to someone else who had four teachers when they were training in medical school, all of them over 80, all of them have passed away. Mm. So it's uh, quite really absolutely mind boggling mm that, uh, and I think it's a really important point to stress because it goes some, back to something we talked about earlier. Not only, you know, being a popular autocrat mm -hmm. or an unpopular autocrat, which obviously plays into it, mm -hmm. but I think there's a more fundamental point to be made here. And that is, I think we have the perception here that China is a ruthlessly efficient administration. Mm -hmm. It's not. Mm -hmm. You know, virtually anybody who works on China, works in China, knows that actually, what gets said in Beijing does not necessarily mm. get carried out in the rest of the country. And I think the chaotic mess around what's happened with COVID mm. clearly shows that um, this is not a system that beats with one mind, one heart altogether. And I think Washington needs to kind of keep that in mind, that it's not kind of the efficient system they maybe think it is. Mm. I, you made that point so many in so many different regards in your writing and um, tonight that I think it's really important. Um, before we go back to Russia, could you tell me what do you think this new COVID policy is going to have an effect on the Chinese economy in general? Um, well, we have to divide out their kind of short term and longer term, obviously. Mm -hmm. The short-term effect is going to be devastating, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe negative growth over the next few months. Mm -hmm. um, if we counted deaths in the way that internationally they're counted, I would be surprised if it's uh, as low as a million. It could be much higher. Mm -hmm. Before things were lifted, uh, Chinese uh, medical academics were saying they predicted that if they'd opened up, they would have something near to two million deaths. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's going to be a lot of death. That's obviously going to have a major impact on the economy. Now, most analysts are really estimating that we're going to see a post-COVID boom mm -hmm. come back with consumerism mm -hmm. and so forth. We may do, but I think it might take longer than we expect because this is going to be rolling out into the countryside and to other cities over a period of time. So in terms of the economic rebound, you see a lot of the optimistic analysts, World Bank and some of the investment houses, mm -hmm. are talking about four, four and a half percent growth this year. Mm -hmm. I think you'll be lucky. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes to the basic question, is, are the problems in the economy COVID or are they about more deeply structural mm -hmm. problems? Mm -hmm. I happen to think it's the latter. Mm -hmm. So I think unless China undertakes other important reforms in the economy, they'll be struggling to make two to three percent growth over mm -hmm. this year. And of course, then there's going to be the international mm -hmm. impacts of all of this. Yeah, could you talk about that for a moment? That was my next question. These okay. people are both so great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, it's going to be varied. Mm. You know, if I was in the tourism business, I'd be rubbing my hands. Mm. You know, if I was in Hong Kong, Macau, I'd be very excited. If I was a mall owner, you know, that <laughs> pent up consumerism. Um, that's going to be a huge boost, uh, generally. Mm 
And there is a view that, um, you know, this is going to lead to kind of global rebound. Well, a positive effect might be to help resuscitate supply chains, which mm -hmm. have been broken by the lockdowns, so on and so forth, although a lot of firms are rethinking their supply chains. But it's also going to have negative effects in terms of countries which are trying to bring down inflation. Because if the Chinese economy does start rebounding, you're going to see demands uh, increasing mm -hmm. for, for oil, for LNG, and that's going to drive up prices. Oil probably will go back up to $100 a barrel. Mm. And so for places like US or Europe, which are trying to sort of bring down inflation, mm -hmm. that could have a seriously mm -hmm. negative impact uh, on mm -hmm. the global economy. So it's going to oh. be mixed. Interesting. OK, Alexandra, talk to me about the Russian economy. OK, first I have to say one okay. thing, right, which is the fact that the Chinese economy has been doing much worse this year than before has paradoxically made the effect of the war on Europe less than it might have been, mm -hmm. right? The big shift away from Russian oil and gas mm -hmm. would have normally led to an enormous increase in prices. It did lead to a high right, rise right, in prices, right. but the fact that Chinese demand was lower meant that Europeans were not competing with China and mm -hmm. with Asia for LNG, and they've been able to actually deal with what they anticipated were going to be shortages. So yes. demand is terrible for European firms because Chinese demand and Chinese economy kind of drives the world economy, but at the same time, it's give, given Europe some breathing room to be able to source the gas from places other than Russia that they might not have otherwise been able to do. Yeah, that's an important Just point. Thank you. Point. No, but I mean, yeah. you have yeah. to, right? <laughs> Especially looking at the Eurasian effect also, thinking about just geopolitically how complex it is and how unpredictable this was, right? And that's one of the things that we've looked at in our reporting a lot is how ill-prepared we all were, right, across the board. So, but to the Russian economy itself, yep. I mean, we, we know the headlines, we read everything, right? But what are you seeing on the ground? Like, what kind of effect is this uh, war on Ukraine, the China dynamic, all of the, the issues around COVID? How, how it, just give me an assessment of that. So I'd like to go back a little bit in time, right? Yeah, please. And, and not to um, February when the war started, but to 2014, which is when the mm -hmm. Ukrainians say that the war started mm -hmm. over the annexation Absolutely. of Crimea. So you'll remember that, that Russia annexed Crimea. There were some sanctions by the US and Europe and uh, a hue and cry, and then everybody kind of got over it, mm -hmm. at least that's the way the Russians saw it, and Germany even signed the Nord Stream 2 agreement to build mm -hmm. a second pipeline mm -hmm. to Europe. So the Russians then assumed that, okay, you do something nasty against Ukraine, people get upset for a while, they impose a few mm -hmm. sanctions, and then everyone moves on. Mm -hmm. And they have been shocked that people have reacted to this new invasion of mm -hmm. Ukraine as if Russia had invaded France, as opposed to just mm -hmm. its neighbor, mm -hmm. right? And that's actually a line that's come up on, on Russian mm -hmm. television. So they were as surprised, I think, as um, the rest of the world that the US and Europe were so unified in introducing a package, uh, packages of extremely mm -hmm. extensive sanctions against, uh, against Russia. The first wave was primarily financial, so cutting Russia out of mm -hmm. SWIFT, freezing uh, foreign assets abroad, which uh, no one expected them to go after the mm -hmm. reserves, and also essentially cutting Russia out of the dollar, mm -hmm. which is important because even if you're not trading in dollars, you're... Right. Your counterparts are often using correspondent banks in New York, and if they can't use those accounts, then they can't do the mm -hmm. trade, which is not in dollars. Mm -hmm. Then there were the individual sanctions. Okay, those were kind of feel good, take away people's mm -hmm. yachts and, and sanction the oligarchs. But most importantly are the sanctions imposed on sectors and mm -hmm. the stress they have put on supply chains into Russia. Mm -hmm. So Russia is now struggling to, to pr manufacture anything. I mean, certainly tanks because they need microchips, which they no longer have access to, mm -hmm. but also washing machines and cars mm -hmm. and all sorts of other um, manufacturing items. So for example, if if you look at the sale of cars year on year, it's fallen about 75%. Mm -hmm. And it's not because people don't want to buy cars, it's mm -hmm. because there are no cars in the dealerships mm -hmm. because they can't complete the parts. And even Russians uh, reducing the regulations, so you don't need side airbags, mm -hmm. you don't need anti-lock brakes, like you don't need all of the things that most cars mm -hmm. had, even that is not getting the shops into the dealer, in the cars into the dealerships. Mm -hmm. So what I expect is that next year is when we're really going 
to see the effect of those supply chain stresses. Right now, they're kind of running on fumes. Mm -hmm. There are some military orders mm -hmm. as the economy moves to kind of a mobilization mm -hmm. model. But eventually, they're not going to have the parts that they need to build most of the things that were built in factories that were employing a lot of the private and mm -hmm. semi-public sector. And that's when I think the real hit to the economy is going to happen. That being said, the shelves are not empty. They don't have Western consumer goods anymore, mm -hmm. but there's plenty of food. And mm -hmm. that's one of the other effects. After 2014, mm -hmm. Russia did a pretty good job of import substitution and food and figuring out how to use local agriculture to supply the shelves and to supply you know, Russian mozzarella. It's, it's not prize winning, but it's good. Mm. That is fascinating. Yeah, 20, Thank you for that. I mean, 2014 and what happened in Crimea, I think it was also important for China's thinking about things. Mm -hmm. And I think they had the same view that, you know, what is going to happen is, well, there'll be the invasion, the West will hum and whore and say, oh, this is terrible, terrible. And after a short period of time, it'll go back to normal. And I think that's what they were anticipating. And so they were also caught out in mm -hmm. the same way mm -hmm. by the strength of that. The other thing they did, though, was they did start putting one or two things in place uh, in case future sanctions came. And in 2014, they introduced their own uh, cross-border payment system mm -hmm. to try and make them less vulnerable to the dollar. So they were sort of anticipating possibly mm -hmm. in the future there might be some other challenges and issues that come up here. That's really interesting. The fact that 2014, in many of our documentaries that we've been airing this fall and coming up in 20 Days in Mariupol, is central to the Ukrainian belief that they've been under attack for eight years, right? This is really central to what they talk about. But for the West, you know, this is, has really broken into the current affairs cycle daily. Um, I want to open can up I, to questions. Can I yeah. add just one more point? I mean, the other important thing about 2014 is that that Russia failed to follow what was happening inside Ukraine. So the Ukrainians were very mobilized by the mm -hmm. fact that they were now annexed by Russia, mm -hmm. that the, the East was being um, confronted with a civil war by mm -hmm. Russian-backed separatists, and it created a sense of civic nationalism in Ukraine that was not there before. Mm. Before, there were what we would call overlapping cleavages, so the Catholics mm -hmm. were in the West, and the Orthodox were in the East, and the Ukrainian speakers in the West, and the mm -hmm. Russian speakers in the, in the East, and the presidency bounced back and forth between more Western-facing and more Russia-facing. But the country was divided enough that it was not really pro-Western mm -hmm. or pro-Russian. What happened after 2014 is the country came together with a sense that they were against Russia. Not everybody, mm -hmm. but enough people so that there was a sense of Ukrainian identity that hadn't been there before. And one of the things we suspect happened is that because Russia was now treating Ukraine as a domestic problem rather than mm -hmm. as another country, they missed the internal shifts in political mm -hmm. culture. And that was one of the reasons why they assumed they could take Kiev in three days and that they would be met in Kiev the way they had been met in Crimea, which anybody who had been following Ukraine since 2014 would have known was very, very unlikely. No, that is, uh, that is a terrific and ter terrific point, and Ashley will help us think through just as you're telling the more longitudinal story of Russia and Ukraine to make sure you're always looking at how the population shifted, right, mm -hmm. in those years. Um, the good news is we have time for questions. We have a lot of time, and I'm hoping, Evelyn, thank you, that we got some great questions from the crowd. Um, and those of you online who are watching, make sure that you put your questions also in the chat, and I'll get to those next. Wonderful. OK, these are some big questions. You ready? We're ready. <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything else from our crowd. <laughs> I'm going to actually go to this one first. OK. What top issues should Congress consider regarding China as it continues to fund Ukraine? So, Tony, we'll start with you. As it continues to fund Ukraine? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that there, you know, I think it goes back to the point I made before. Washington look, needs to look very carefully at what uh, China is actually doing as much as what it's, it's saying and just to keep monitoring that it really is not engaging in trade uh, and exchanges in those areas which are subject to U.S. sanctions. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be rigid on that. Uh, similarly, I think the same point uh, can be made to make sure that 
unlike Iran, it doesn't seem to be applying, supplying um, uh, weaponry that mm -hmm. can be used. And that is, again, I think would be a key area to sort of keep uh, an eye on. And then third, though, I think there has to be um, consistent dialogue with China, because I don't think anybody really is able to make Putin uh, shift his views. But the one country that does have some influence is China for the reasons we've been mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. previously. Uh, it seems, you know, from Erdogan in uh, Turkey that, uh, yes, he talks to Putin frequently, but it doesn't seem to do anything to change mm -hmm. uh, Putin's mind. We do know, as I said, uh, that the uh, Chinese comments about nuclear use certainly resonated in Moscow mm -hmm. and did have an outcome and a result. So I think Washington should begin to define what is realistic um, for China to be able to insert into the conversation in Moscow and to be clear about that. And also then I think to raise consequences if those things are not pushed uh, forward. A really good question about NATO, which I was going to get to in my question, so I'll just jump to this really wise question. How does one reconcile past U.S. assurances that NATO would not expand eastward with current talks about Ukraine joining NATO? Okay, that that's like an hour and a half conversation <laughs> right <know>. there. <laughs> There's actually a everyone's very, nodding in yeah. the crowd, like, yeah. this is, but this is really a really important question. So there's a fantastic book by a historian called Mary Serrote called Not One Inch, which looks into this question of whether or not the U.S. and the Reagan administration prom and the Bush administration promised that NATO mm -hmm. would not expand to the east, right? And the Russian argument is that Gorbachev was told that a unified Germany could join NATO, and then NATO mm -hmm. would not move one inch more. And it looks like this is something that James Baker, as Secretary mm -hmm. of State, floated as a trial balloon, as he was wont to do, mm -hmm. um, in one meeting, and then never mentioned again. So there is nowhere in writing that the Americans and NATO promised not to move to the east. That being said, NATO did move 600 miles mm -hmm. to the east and encroached into what the Russians had, uh, so they had a series of concentric mm -hmm. buffer zones, if you will. Mm -hmm. One were the former Soviet states, which what we call, you know, in Central Asia and the Caucasus, mm -hmm. Belarus and Ukraine. And then around that, there was the Warsaw Pact, which was the analog to NATO. And those Warsaw Pact countries, for the most part, joined NATO as fast as they could after the collapse of the mm -hmm. Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. And that moved NATO much closer to Russia. Having Ukraine be part of Russia would move the border again another 600 miles closer to Moscow. And so one could say, yes, you know, that appears threatening if one thought that NATO was actually going to invade Ukraine, which is the Russian argument. Mm -hmm. Now, in political science, there's a big debate, right? On the one side, you have the realists who say, NATO made Putin invade Ukraine. If we hadn't expanded to the east, then okay. for sure, like, he would have never had mm -hmm. to take Ukraine. To my mind, there are a few weaknesses to that argument. One is that when Finland and Sweden said they were going to join NATO, mm -hmm. the Russians actually moved troops right. away from that border closer mm -hmm. to Ukraine. If you were really worried that NATO was looking for an opening to get into Russia, like, that would make no sense. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that in the summer, uh, in last July of last summer, Putin wrote this 7,000 word we have to call it a screed, basically arguing that Ukraine was not a real country, it was always part of Russia, and Russia had the right to reclaim that territory mm -hmm. at will. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think that Ukraine is actually part of your territory, then it doesn't really matter what NATO does, because you believe you have a right mm -hmm. to take Ukraine. That it's not like France, mm -hmm. right? It's basically like your next door neighbor, mm -hmm. and, and you can mm -hmm. take his house whenever you want. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that NATO expansion is what made Russia invade Ukraine, if that's the fundamental question. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the war has made NATO much more useful, right? For a long yeah. time after the end of the Cold War, NATO had no, no raison d'etre, right? No reason to exist. Mm -hmm. And for sure, there was a missed opportunity to create new security architecture for Europe that would have somehow integrated Russia into a more stable situation. That moment, unfortunately, passed. And now what we have is Russia standing up to NATO and NATO naturally reinforcing some of those um, borders, mm 
in order to make sure that Russia doesn't try and move into, say, Poland. Hmm. I know you were trying to simplify that. I appreciate (laughs) that. Thank you. No, I agree entirely. And the main point is now that, of course, with the invasion, the reality on the ground has just changed. Mm. And whatever the arguments were before, we're dealing with a different reality on the ground. And so, you know, Finland, Sweden wanting to join. uh, You know, I I don't think there would have been any impulse for them Mm -hmm. to join or any receptivity for them to join without that invasion. And... uh, the big question is going to be if and when uh, the conflict is resolved, what does happen with Ukraine? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, does it have some kind of loose affiliation to NATO, incorporating into NATO, into NATO mm-hmm. if uh, Putin has been humiliated in some way, mm-hmm. would be also uh, inflammatory? So that's going to be a huge question of how to deal with that subsequently. There's a great question, um, which is not on my list, which I I would love to share with you. So, Tony, I think this is for you. Um, I've heard that some Chinese people think the U.S. caused the war in Ukraine so the EU market would turn back to the U.S. and ease its recession. What do you think of this argument? Well, you know, there's conspiracy theorists everywhere. I mean, it's a ludicrous uh, argument. but yes, I've, I've seen, you know, arguments and you see, you know, a lot of things online of similar vein that the whole strategy of the U.S. is uh, that whenever any economy gets to something like 60% of the size of the American economy, uh, the U.S. moves to squash it. Mm. And it did this with Japan, it did it with others, uh, and now, of course, it's going to do it with China. And I, I think this kind of comment feeds into that sort of same... Uh, conspiratorial sort of thinking that somehow, I, you know, I, I'm not sure Washington's smart enough, to be honest, to really <laughs> thought that up and impose that as an idea. Okay, thanks. Very, very good. I was wondering where you were going to go with Washington there. Um, okay, I'm going to read this question to you, and I have a couple of great questions online too. Um, thank you for those questions. So, in Bloodlands, Timothy Snyder argues that for Hitler, Ukraine was his the prize to get, and for Stalin, it was the prize to keep. Can Putin envision a future for Russia without Ukraine? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. Is there an end, I guess this says, is there an end to the war where Putin saves face? These are wonderful questions, thank you. Wow, okay. (laughs) So start with the first one. Can Putin envision a future for Russia without Ukraine? Mm. You know, in many ways, he's backed himself into a corner, Mm -hmm. right? By saying that Ukraine is part of Russia, that the country should not exist independently, that um, traditionally, over the past centuries, Russia has reclaimed the territories that belong to it. I mean, he's Mm -hmm. really made it very difficult to say, actually, like, forget it. (laughs) I'm not interested. And I think this also speaks to the, the point that Tony made, that, you know, wars don't end because one side or the other changes their goals. Right, mm-hmm. and they decide, we, actually, we don't want Ukraine. It ends because one side realizes it doesn't have the capability to achieve its goals. Mm-hmm. So I don't think the question is, you know, how do we get Putin to accept that he can't have Ukraine? Mm-hmm. Right? The question is, how do we get Putin to accept that he cannot win the war in Ukraine? Mm-hmm. And the question of how you make some kind of peace after that is extremely complicated because it's, it's very difficult to imagine that Russia can pull back without the kind of deep, humiliating defeat that's fundamentally destabilizing to the Kremlin. And I think that's the moment when we would be afraid of the potential use of tactical nuclear weapons. Mm. It's, not, it's not anymore about a battlefield advantage. And, and I should say that you know strategic nuclear weapons are the ones you put on a big missile and you lob across the Atlantic mm-hmm. and they, they hit New York, right? A tactical nuclear weapon is a small one that goes mm-hmm. a small distance and it's used to get some advantage on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. And I think the Chinese warnings mm-hmm. have been sufficient that the Russians have, mm-hmm. have taken that off the table. But Russia's military doctrine says that they would use nuclear weapons if the very existence of the state was in question. Mm-hmm. And what we don't know is at what point does Putin mm-hmm. decide that a retreat from these occupied mm-hmm. lands or a retreat from Crimea is so humiliating mm-hmm. that it constitutes a threat to him and then he decides that's actually a threat to the Russian state. And, and I think that that is not an insignificant concern. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's the crucial question. Is it the existence of the state or is it the existence of Putin? Mm-hmm. 
Now, obviously, in Putin's mind, the two are indivisible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is, for me, difficult to envisage a solution while Putin is still there. Mm -hmm. And Alexander would know better than I whether it's feasible for Putin to be removed uh, and whether that can contribute to any kind of resolution. I mean, the, the way I think about it is, is I, I don't think this is a Putin problem anymore, right? This is a mm -hmm. Russia problem. Because even if Putin is mm -hmm. removed, it would be politically very difficult for someone mm -hmm. to take his mm -hmm. place saying, let's just pull out of Ukraine mm -hmm. and, and consolidate mm -hmm. what we had before. That is going to be such a weak position that whoever that person is, is basically going to be removed immediately. So the risk is that Putin is replaced by one of the other hardliners around him. Mm -hmm. and. You know, we don't know what they think, but it's unlikely to be, you know, more more soft leaning or Western leaning than than Putin himself. Mm. Right. And uh, one of the questions is, of course, you don't have a crystal ball, either one of you. But where do you see this going? <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to answer yeah. that. <laughs> I love being a journalist I, I in these moments. I forgot my crystal ball. Yes. So, um, <laughs> You know, war, wars end in, in four outcomes, right? And, and I should say, first of all, that there's a study um, that was done with data from the University of Uppsala and uh, looked at by the Center for Strategic and International Studies that found that a quarter of wars um, end in a month, right? Another quarter or so end in a year. And the half that don't end in a year go on for a very long time, mm. right? It becomes more and more difficult for the mm. sides to make concessions that would allow them to stop mm. the war. And I'm afraid as we come up on February 24th, mm -hmm. that that is definitely the most likely outcome at this mm. point. And it's most likely why? Be because of what I mentioned before, mm -hmm. like the sides are not going to mm -hmm. come to the table and make an, a negotiation settlement or an armistice if they both think they can win. And right now, both sides still think that they can win. Mm. So a protracted conflict is much more likely than, say, a negotiated settlement um, or an armistice with some kind of militarized or demilitarized zone. Um, and total victory for either side at this point still seems out of reach, in part because it would require that the losing side accept the outcome of the mm. war, and neither side is going to accept that. But there, I mean, the important factor that plays into that, uh, even though we don't have a leader of Congress at the moment, is really how um, Washington and Europe are going to respond. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, is their support really open-ended mm -hmm. uh, at the financial levels that it's been providing support to date? Or as the public sort of tires, in a sense, that this is news we've been seeing for a year, you don't have the political pressure, momentum there that uh, constraints are set around the levels of funding, what funding can be for, and whether that uh, creates a significant change in terms of what uh, Ukraine is able to achieve in terms of resistance to uh, uh, Russian aggression and oppression. Um, and that is one possibility that might force an unfavorable set of discussions for Ukraine about some kind of uh, conclusion. And this is what Putin is counting on. Yeah, actually, of course. You know, Putin yeah. thinks that democracies are inherently weak yeah. mm -hmm. because you're only in office for a few years, then you're voted out of office. And so, you know, you can just wait out a conflict with the West. We'll get tired, we'll stop giving money, we'll get distracted, we'll get polarized, and then they can come back and finish the task that they set themselves. Yeah, well, absolutely. thank you for that plug for a frontline <laughs> film called Putin and the Presidents. <laughs> Notice presidents is in plural as we investigate his relationship with all of the American presidents this is his tenure. Um, Evelyn, we have more questions, which is great. Thank you for these great questions. Wonderful. I'm gonna ask a question that's out of the blue, but really important. Um, could the U.S. have helped Hong Kong hold on to their democracy? Such an important question. Takes us into a different realm. I think that's uh, almost inconceivable. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, what we've seen taking place, uh, you know, was the kind of slow squeeze to start with mm -hmm. on... Uh, freedoms and situations in Hong Kong. And then, of course, following all the demonstrations, I think Beijing, in coalition, I think, with uh, elites in Hong Kong, particularly business elites, felt enough was enough, mm. and the situation had to be you know, shut and closed down. 
under those circumstances, it's very difficult to see what else the US could have done to have prevented that. Um, it's n unlikely something that they would have undertaken extensive sanctions uh, to prevent that situation. Certainly, um, you know, the criticism, rightly, that has been uh, voiced consistently about Beijing's behavior there has been important. Mm -hmm. I think what it has led to is a deeper understanding of the significance of Taiwan mm -hmm. and the significance mm -hmm. of other uh, allies within the region, uh, including Japan, South Korea, and how vulnerable uh, their situation could be to Chinese aggression, and that that really strengthens American resolve, mm -hmm. at least on the current administration, uh, to ensure uh, that they are fully integrated and supported. So in Hong Kong itself, it's really hard to have seen. Once Beijing made the decision, it was going to break with the idea that um, the freedoms and guarantees could exist for 50 years. It was very hard to see what the US or other countries really could have done uh, to stop that situation just kind of uh, rolling through. Um, and, you know, there was no real uh, democratic infrastructure within Hong Kong, mm -hmm. similarly, that could have resisted it. And what was there uh, was slowly dismantled uh, with the press and then with the uh, elections, you know, the, the four uh, elected MPs from the Democratic Party mm -hmm. were first suspended mm -hmm. and then they were kicked out. Um, and basically, uh, as the situation that Alexander has talked about, in Russia, anybody who didn't like it and was vocal, you leave. Mm -hmm. And what is detrimental to Hong Kong is that a lot of the uh, qualified and educated elites have been moving out of Hong Kong. And sorry, the last thing I would just say is that there's a process which has been taking place for a long period of time, and that's the mainlandization of Hong mm -hmm. Kong. You know, you see a lot of companies, uh, a lot of wealthy mainland Chinese resettling in Hong Kong. You see a lot of academics coming into the universities in Hong Kong. And friends of mine teaching there started saying, look, the universities here are beginning to run more along the lines and principles of universities on the mainland than the way they used to be in Hong Kong under those uh, circumstances. So you've seen that kind of creeping uh, mainlandization uh, taking place. And I think that has really significantly changed uh, a lot of the dynamics within Hong Kong itself. Mm, that's great. So before we go back to Ukraine and the war, um, there was a question from our online audience. Um, can you comment on the Belt and Road Initiative? Yes. In <laughs> a couple of minutes? <laughs> um, it's a slogan. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot... You know, a lot of things in China are really slogans. They're mm -hmm. not really programs as mm -hmm. such. So the Belt and Road is kind of anything anybody wanted it to be. So like every province had their own Belt and Road program. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many universities set up a Belt and Road Research Institute because you could get money from the central mm -hmm. government. But there was no really coherent uh, framework to it. So again, I think these sort of fears that this was somehow going to be China's strategy to uh, encourage debt traps and so on. Mm. I mean, it really started because of its uh, overinvestment in 2008, 2009 uh, to keep its economy going, that it had massive excess capacity, cement, steel, etc., which needed to be exported, and it did. The one thing I will say, and this drifts a little bit away from the Belt and Road Initiative, I think that one of the things that the Chinese leadership have looked at with great powers is that great powers control standard setting in forefront industries. Mm -hmm. When they look at the US, that's what they did. When you look at my country, mm -hmm. the UK, mm -hmm. that's what we did a long time ago. And I think the way they see, one way they see Belt and Road operating is that they're putting a lot of money into what they see as the eight forefront sort of technologies for AI and uh, uh, bio and other uh, areas, and that they want to invest in those to get to the forefront, to use their overseas investment strategies uh, to push those technologies out, 
so that they will then control the setting of standards in those key industries. Mm -hmm. And I think they see that as a way of accumulating their power. Now, what the US has done recently, I think, will hamper their abilities to develop some of those forefront technologies. But in as far as there's something coherent there, that's what I would say it is. That's Can great. I jump Thank in? You. Yes, okay. why not? So, <laughs> Please, so I expect you to. One um. of the interesting things that's happened is that China and its Belt and Road investment projects or related investment projects, you know, whether they're part of a coherent strategy or not, have been quite important in getting some of the countries that used to be closely allied with Russia through mm. the Soviet Union to think about themselves as to some extent torn between Russia and China. So I'm thinking particularly of the Central Asian states mm -hmm. that have been very happy to get Chinese investment. Mm -hmm. Russia was not able to economically invest in those countries. And the Chinese have been instrumental in not only building infrastructure like you know, cement, concrete infrastructure, but also digital infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, particularly in the introduction of so-called smart cities, which are high surveillance mm -hmm. cities, which a lot of the Central Asian uh, rulers are interested in having. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, those countries managed to balance between Russia sort of for military relationships and China for mm -hmm. economic relationships. And now, because Russia is so weakened with what it's done in Ukraine, the Central Asian countries are having a moment where they're thinking, like, how much do we really have to be allied to Russia? Mm -hmm. You know, should we yeah. be closer to China? Do we have the possibility to get more independence? And so, ironically, one of the impacts of Russia's war in Ukraine is that it might lose some of those, the inner circle of mm. buffer states that it always counted on because those states now don't think that Russia can enforce their uh, conflicts in a, in a meaningful way and also can't be counted on to stay out of their business. That's yeah, really we see this playing out in other parts of the world as well, uh, not just related to uh, China and Russia, but obviously you know, China and the US in Southeast Asia, for mm -hmm. example, and Africa. And what you hear uh, continually in Southeast Asia is we don't want to be forced to choose. Mm -hmm. And you're beginning to see the emergence of an economic Asia, which is very much focused on China, its mm -hmm. trade, its investments, mm -hmm. but a residual security Asia, which is still uh, centered on the United States and its mm -hmm. alliances. Mm -hmm. And having those two kind of pulled apart, and this is why I think it was a big mistake of the US not to, I understand why, but why uh, not going into TPP, mm -hmm. Trans-Pacific Partnership, mm -hmm. created a problem because that would have fused together the economic and the strategic. And now you have those two, par two apart. But eventually choices are gonna have to be made. I mean, you can't really run two AI or two internet mm -hmm. systems, one based mm -hmm. on Chinese right. uh, technology, one based on US or Western technologies. Right. So it's a huge issue. And mm -hmm. you see it playing out also in Africa where, mm -hmm. you know, the US of course has been far less engaged. Mm -hmm. But interestingly there, a lot of the telephone technology is 3D technology mm -hmm. that China's been pushing out. It's not particularly advanced. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to have two more questions and then we'll have some time together. The um, professors will be in the crowd with you all. Uh, why doesn't the West get more aggressive and end the Putin era? <laughs> uh, meaning assassinate Putin? I <laughs> don't know, but yeah. I would assume. Get more aggressive. Maybe, maybe that means it just not giving just aid, but perhaps our own military. Let's go in that direction. Okay. So, or does it maybe mean earlier in the Putin? Why didn't regime? we? Why didn't we act yeah. earlier? Perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, I mean any, the, any question around this is a good question. <laughs> absolutely. Is, yeah. Like, yeah. So I'm, I'm just buying time right? here as I think <laughs> of the answer. Um, so. <laughs> You know, in general, it's it's not a great look to openly get rid of another leader. Mm -hmm. um, and the Russians have been saying that that's one of the things that the United States wanted to do, that mm -hmm. uh, we, were, mm -hmm. we were into supporting, for example, Russian NGOs and Russian opposition because we wanted regime change. We wanted mm -hmm. to get rid of Putin. Um, and one of the most shocking things that I heard is right after Donald Trump's, ele Trump's election, I was in Moscow uh, meeting with some university professors and, and think tank people, and they were saying, you know, thank God Trump won, we're totally surprised, but thank God he won because Hillary Clinton would have started war with Russia. Mm -hmm. 
right? So there's always been this understanding or this perception that the U.S. really wants to run Russia or take it over in one way or another. And that's a very convenient narrative for Putin because he can say that he needs to stay there in order to fight that. Um, in terms of... Um, like potentially removing him now, as I mentioned before, I don't think that solves the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, in a way, any attempt to um, to create political fracturing in the Kremlin only strengthens the argument that NATO and the U.S. actually want to have regime change in Russia and allows Putin to mobilize more support among the population mm -hmm. because now they really are under attack. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that that's not a winning strategy. Um, in terms of why it is we were not tougher on Putin, right, that's a legitimate question. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for a long time there was the feeling that, you know, we don't, we don't have to love Russia in order to deal with it. We don't necessarily love China, and we have a, a, a pretty mm -hmm. robust economic mm -hmm. relationship. Can we find the areas where we want to cooperate with Russia on arms control, on certain limited areas of trade, on pandemic control, mm -hmm. on anti-terrorism, on anti-narcotics, mm -hmm. on Afghanistan, that make it worth while to continue dialogue. And for a long time, the answer was, like, dialogue is right. more productive than no dialogue. And I would argue now the fact that there's no dialogue makes it even more difficult for us to understand what's going on in Russia and makes it much more difficult for the Russians to understand what's going on in the U.S. And that's actually not in either of our interests. Hmm. Actually, yeah, because we, we, just were, we just was reporting on that whole longitudinal relationship with all of our presidents. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you say that because this is the one Aaron, which we're not having that relationship that's that's extremely intertwined even if it's complex so mm -hmm. i take your point on that yes tony no i'm just going to say i mean uh, you know a strong point of support for xi jinping is a very similar kind of argumentation that uh, you know the u.s is out to get us no matter what mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter what we do and i've heard from many people in china people you might think of as being more sort of liberal in their approach mm -hmm. and view are quite convinced that uh, even if we became a democracy tomorrow, you know, America would still be after us. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, feeds into a clear support base for Xi Jinping of the sort of nationalist uh, story which is told, you know, the years of humiliation, mm -hmm. and now, you know, America wants to humiliate us again, only with a strong communist party, can we develop, can we grow, can we move ahead, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, take our rightful place in the world. They're similar narratives, actually. Right, I was just going to yeah. say, you know, it's actually similar narratives in the sense of where we are at this time, especially mm -hmm. with the challenges that they both face. Um, so there's one last question that I'll ask. Uh, what's the latest on Putin's health? Are stories of his health failing credible? You know, he's not young, especially for a Russian man. The average life expectancy is, is 65, and, uh, and he's older than that. Um, I don't think he's going to drop dead from one day to the next if we're thinking that we just have to wait a little longer. <laughs> um, I, th I think the war in Ukraine is going to last uh, longer than Putin. Uh, but he's not going to be going off the scene anytime soon. I do think that when we focus on his health and when we argue, you know, the guy is unhinged and he's making crazy statements, um, it's a mistake for us not to take him seriously and not to assume that he actually is a rational actor with maybe obsessive ideas about Ukraine, but that the decisions that he's taking make sense given how he's thinking about mm -hmm. them. And once we start saying like he's crazy or he's irrational mm -hmm. or he's being emotional, we stop being very thoughtful about what it is that's driving Putin and Russia and being able to counter it effectively. So there's one last question um, that I really appreciate from the audience, uh, which takes us back into Ukraine again. How is the war impacting women specifically in Ukraine? That is a great question. And, and one thing that we haven't really mentioned is the fact that the, the, the most serious damages and losses that are happening right now are actually the Ukrainians themselves, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, the country is being blown mm -hmm. to bits, especially in the South and in the mm -hmm. East. Um, the new use of Iranian drones is mm -hmm. causing incredible damage, not only to energy infrastructure, but to some of the areas in Ukraine that had been spared the conflict mm -hmm. in the past. Um, and we really shouldn't forget that and shouldn't underestimate that. Now, when it comes to women and children, one of the things that's very interesting is that there's been an enormous amount of migration 
within Ukraine from the, the east to the west, about 7 million people are internally displaced, that's the estimate, and about the same number have left Ukraine. But one of the things that we've noticed, we're, I, I'm involved in a, a study right now of refugees in Poland and in Germany, and we noticed that most of those migrants are actually moving back and forth, right? It's much less a humanitarian refugee crisis where people go there and like they need to be set up for life, and more a question of labor migration. Like people, yes, they're leaving because mm -hmm. the war is, is ruining their house, but they're taking their children with them, mm -hmm. and they're trying to go back to visit their husband or to visit their grandmother or to take mm -hmm. care of you know, whatever is left there. And so there's a very unusual situation situation now where most of the people who left Ukraine are women and children because the men between 18 and 60 are not allowed to leave. Right. But it's a, 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 quite a fluid border and people are going back and forth. That's not to say that there's not an enormous need for humanitarian support for mm -hmm. these populations in Moldova, in Poland, in Germany, where Germany, most of these people right. have ended up. But they're highly skilled people and they're not, um, they're not having some of the issues that other refugees had, you know, for, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. um, there's really been uh, an outpouring of support across mm -hmm. Poland and across Germany and Europe to try and help these people with the understanding that everyone wants the war to be over sooner rather than later so they can go home. Most of these people are very, very eager to go home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've seen that in some of our reporting over the last year. So many families coming back, leaving again, mm -hmm. and, and that's really unusual from mm -hmm. our reporting and what we've seen with refugee populations across the world. So I really right. appreciate that point. Thank you both so much. This was an amazing, you, <laughs> really, really inspiring conversation. One of the most interesting conversations we could be having right now, and I appreciate us talking together. Thank you. And you'll be here you. after for a little bit yes. to talk and um, visit with all of you in the crowd. So I want to just say thank you to everyone online as well. Um, there is a robust outpouring online for us. And thank mm -hmm. you, everyone, in the Boston Public Library tonight and for both of you again for shedding the light on these critical questions facing not just Russia and Ukraine and China, but us here in the US and across the globe. Special thanks, and this is a long list, an important <laughs> list, Thomas O'Brien, the CEO of HYM Investments, Mark Young, CEO of Asaxio, and co-producers Tisch College for Civic Life, and its Dean Dana Cunningham, and the Institute for Global Leadership at Tufts University, and of course, Ed DeMoor, CEO of the Boston Global Bridge Institute. Rick Burns, Stephen Gagg, and Evelyn Brito, the BPL studio manager, amazing producer, <laughs> event producer, and of course, welcome again to GBH's president and CEO, Susan Goldberg. I'd also like to thank everyone in our audience tonight for joining us at the GBH BPL studio. Your support of nonprofit public media is critical in our effort to report in times of crises like these and to continue making investigative documentaries like we've done at Frontline for the past 40 years. So thank you.